My name is Monk Grove for the Phileas Jazz Archive. And boy, I'm very happy to have Chuck Findlay with me today. And one of your colleagues, who's a decent trumpet player named Jerry Hay said, Chuck Finley can play anything. Well, that's a lovely compliment, I must say, Mark. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you, that, that really goes back to like when we were recording a lot of the Al Jarreau stuff and just a lot of ridiculous things. And uh, Jerry was a wonderful trumpet player when he could play, but then he had an issue with his throat and he couldn't play mm -hmm. anymore. So he just uh, became a writer, which he was anyhow. And he became a fantastic uh, commercial writer. Um, but Jerry would always, uh, he would play everything he wrote before he brought it to a session uh, and um, to make sure everybody could play it, uh, which was, uh, you know, and it was difficult. And he was, a, like I said, a, what a marvelous trumpet player Jerry was. So he would play it. So we knew that it was playable, not necessarily going to be easy, but we knew it was playable. Um, and, um, well, if you've heard any of the things that uh, Jerry has ever written and the things that we played, you would know uh, how difficult it was. But um, back in those days, uh, like I said, we were, well, I didn't say yet to you or to the people, but we were very busy, you know, running from one date to another date, you know, back and forth. Gary Grant was also involved with that sessions in the Travis section, the three of us. Um, but now we're talking about in the 70s now, mid-70s to 80s and all that. But way before that, uh, I was playing... Um, well, the records the records for me started, really started, like um, when I came here to town. And I in 19... I moved here in 69. And in 70, I was, uh, I was very, very busy. Ollie Mitchell was my guru. And Ollie... Um, got basically got me started in the records. You know, he said, you know, he just took me with him everywhere. And I do, I did, I was working three sessions a day besides jingles and uh, film calls and movies as well. Um, but it was, um, my breakthrough was at A&M and, &M and uh, as a soloist, I'm getting at Monk, is what they asked me, um, it was for the uh, Carpenters and it was uh, the tune, uh, close to you and I played that uh, flugelhorn solo on close to you and I double tracked it and everybody heard that and from then on I got called to do so many solos on records commercial records monk that, not that, just, record. that is so interesting because I went and revisited that and it it's literally four bars plus plus two b a two beat pickup right. and and the fact that it it brought you that that recognition and that um Herb Alpert had something to do with that song, didn't he? Well, Bert Backrack wrote it. Bert and wrote Herb it. and Herb was supposed to do the solo on it. Um and he I think he did, and they weren't happy with it. So uh, I'll tell you on that session there were three three trumpets. It was myself was Ollie Mitchell and Buddy Childers, the three of us. Now, at the end of the date, uh, but Buddy did the solo first on flugelhorn. That was another thing. Buddy did it. And then after the date was over, they asked me to stay and asked me to do it. And I did it. And that's the one that was used. Now, Buddy thought he had done it. Uh, it was, you know, and I never went out and said, well, Buddy didn't do it. I did it, you know, because I love Buddy and he was a marvelous player. I uh, I just let it, let it alone, and uh, of course, people found out that I did it later. And then from there, I just, like I said, did so many different solos on commercial records from that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was very busy before that, though, as well. Yeah, before we leave that, the, um, there's the lick, there's this, it's not even a doit, but, but uh, duh, there's a very slight thing where you, you know, you slide up and was that hard to double? And did you listen to yourself, you know, the first time you did it, did you have headphones and then you're listening to the first time to add the second? Absolutely. I, getting back to that, the, the do I, the double and that's an F, RF sharp, an E concert. Uh, it's very hard to dip into that note, you know, and, and Bert Backrack, of course, who wrote the song, 
he uh i don't know if you know but people know that Bert was Bert was very very um very particular with what he wanted we'd do something 12 times and end up with the first one you know uh but you know he's talking about the the separation of Ba ba beep. That's the wrong key. Ba 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 de do 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 da do do da. You know. Okay. So now getting back to doubling that, I wore the cans always on one ear and off on the other one, so I could hear myself. Um, and I would. It was actually I just did it one time, the double, because um, and the natural reverb on that they didn't have to use reverb in the booth. Because when you play the same thing yourself, you have natural reverb. So it and it worked out perfect, you know. Um, but I've been told by many, many trumpet players that they, they do these different gigs, hardest gigs, and and that tune, particular tune, comes up, and when they have to play that solo, they're scared to death to play it because it's it's so simple, but also so difficult at the same time. Well, you so, answered uh, you you answered a question I was going to ask because I I recently watched this marvelous performance of yours with um, Nature Boy and the James Last Orchestra. Yeah, man, I mean you, that one performance sort of in, encapsulates what you're capable of with the soloing and the the respectful treatment of the melody and then some really high high notes so when you when you think of close to you and that performance is one harder than the other i'd say close to you is harder only because uh only because i was i wasn't free to improvise on anything like that it had to be uh it had to be done note by note, right? I mean, I couldn't on close on uh, Nature Boy. It was I was free to do whatever I pleased to do. So I could um, every night I had to play it. So I'd play it different every night. You know, it wasn't it wasn't that I had to do it. I mean, of course, the melody you play, but I, the melody also was not just the melody the way I'd play it the night before. I'd play it differently every night. Because that's what an artist does, or at least what I do, anyhow. I mean, there are many, many players that play notes. Um, you know, anybody could be uh, play what's music that's written in front of them. I mean, they could practice and shed, you know, eight hours a day for all their life, and they can't improvise at all. But they can play the notes that are on the paper. That is not being a, an artist uh, that I consider an artist or a creative person. Um, but the schooling of being a precise player, like you had mentioned, uh, is very, very important. And I recommend that uh, studying classical music is, uh, you need to have that. That's the basis. You have the basis down and then you go from there. Okay. Uh, it's like I played with records and records when I was growing up and I'd play, geez, I started with Bobby Hackett. And because my brother is, is my idol, and still is, he's eight years older than me, my brother Bob. And uh, so I had a cornet, that's why I started. And um, Bobby Hackett was the records that I played. My dad was also a wonderful saxophone player that doubled on violin. But so we had music in our house all the time, all the time. I mean, live music. People would come over and play. So I thought that was a normal, natural thing, you know. And I, can I ask you a little jam sessions, you know? Yeah. Let me ask you about that because um I heard you talking about that and that your dad would play in restaurants and he would stroll. Um he'd pick up the violin and maybe stroll around. And I wondered, did you and your and your brother Bob actually witness that? Did you go to these places? I did. My brother may have, since he's eight years older than me. Um, I did not. But I did, um, he would take me to gigs when I was 14, playing in uh, with the big band. I'd be like playing fourth. I was thrilled to death to beat. I couldn't drive yet. And he would drive me there and he'd sit at the bar and have a beer and he knew everybody in the band. And he was so proud of me, you know. He'd sit there, he wasn't on the gig. 
but I, uh, it was wonderful, you know, it was so, all that happened when I was young, you know, and I, like I said, 14 years old, you know, and I joined the union around that time too, you know, um, I couldn't drive, but uh, I would do gigs, um, and I was still, in, of course, in school, so after the gig, you know, I'd sleep in the back seat with the drums or something like that in the car, you know, uh, but I always played. I, no matter where I was, I would always go and take a cab, or if I could walk to the jazz club, where when doing one nighters, I would every night I play, and that's how you learn. I was just going to say, what what did you learn um, from sitting next to those older fellows in a big band situation? Just beyond the not only the the playing of the music, but just an observation of how they behaved well you know what it was always well sitting next to snooki sitting next to sweets sitting next to uh i mean i could go down the line you know conti condoli p condoli john Ardino, ray triscary uh yuan racy uh there's a uh, jimmy jimmy zito uh just so many players that I worked with all the time that, I mean, I'm talking about daily basis. I'd work with these people. And what I learned from them was, well, first of all, they were very relaxed and uh, they did not, uh, they weren't uptight at all. You know, there were a few, few people that were, you know, and, you know, I won't mention any names who they were, but there were a few, but mo most everybody was, it was a family. We just, uh, we just got along. What I learned from them was just to play my horn like I did when I was a kid. You know, I was just playing my horn, have fun, make music. You know, and and when you're when you're in a happy environment, you make happy music. Yeah, uh, it comes out that way. You know, it's not stiff. It's not like business music. You know, which today, in this day and age, it is business music. They. Uh, it's all about business. And like I mentioned earlier to you before we started the Zoom, is that uh, these people, um, they have to, they get there an hour early before the session, you know, and then the contractor's wondering where they are if they're not there. I hope you're not hearing that, but uh, somebody's... I'm not, actually. Okay, I got a, a little ping on my, uh, I don't know what they want now. Um, anyhow, no, but... Um, it was it was fun. It was great working in Louis Belson's big band when I first moved to town. Uh, you know, it was just wonderful. It was like playing in the club. Doing a, doing a session was like playing in a club. When we did the, the trilogy album for Frank Sinatra, when I did that, you know, it was um, there was was no nothing was uptight. It was all we were making great music for Frank, and Frank did one take. And that's it, you know. It wasn't like you know, twelve takes, you know. Like there's so many things like that nowadays. You know, well, nowadays they 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 can punch in one note, you know, and they fly it into another part of the tune, you know, because it sounded better than the one you did later. So they pick the best one, and then they, you know, it's like it's putting together a puzzle is what they do. Uh, that that loses the magic and the beauty of of the art of music and uh, creativity. It I sounds feel. like you're describing a situation that there was so much work and so many good musicians, but it was not competitive. Like how come, how come they called that guy for this gig instead of me? That that wasn't a necessary thing that happened at the time. It did. It did happen, but it was only because of their performance. And um, personalities had a lot to do with it as well, I think. Uh, you know, there were some people that were, once again, no more names, but uh, that were not the nicest, uh, you know, mm -hmm. person to have on the in the band. Uh, but in general, I'd say 90% of them or more were wonderful, happy people. You know, and like I said, that happiness comes out through that piece of brass that you have in your hands. Uh, and it's uh, what, what you'd hear if a sweets play, 
Sweets had a signature. Uh, he was funny too, very funny. I mean, so I mean, we'd we'd tell jokes and lines and things. Well, you know, and I mean, they, if anything, the, the leader would have to tell us, "Hey, come on, guys, you know, be a little quiet here, you know, because we we're having too much fun." Uh, but it came out on the record, the beauty of having fun and through music, and that's the way I always grew up. And when I played, I always had fun. Did that's why. Did you sit next to Jack Sheldon on occasion? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I sure did. I got a couple of stories about that, too. I don't know. Well, yeah, I could tell you. I could tell you. This is beautiful. We were at Universal. We had a nine in the morning call, and it was a double session. And it was a Monday. And um, we called him the Creeper. Jack was the Creeper. And the reason he was called the Creeper is because he'd creep in, and then he'd creep out. And so we're doing this uh, nine in the morning double session at Universal. And the contractor's name was Bobby Helfer. And Bobby was a real, real, I mean, he was absolutely fantastic as a contractor. As far as we went um, 30 seconds over, we got overtime. We got 20 minutes overtime. I mean, he was, he didn't uh, give in at all. He was really a wonderful uh, contractor for musicians. But he was also very, um, he, he didn't want anybody to he wouldn't go to lunch with anybody or anything like that because he thought they were kissing ass and they would want what work from him so anyhow so he's the contractor at universal now jack's on the call everybody's there and like i said it wasn't an hour before we get in you know 10 minutes five minutes before the session get out our horns and ready to perform and uh no jack jack's not there so now nine o'clock comes goes by 10 after 9 20 after no, Jack. Well, somebody mentioned that Jack was in San Francisco he, that weekend. He was doing a gig in San Francisco. So Jack comes in, and as he's walking in, Bobby Helfer immediately goes up to him as he's walking in to come to his chair. And he says to him, says, um, before he could say anything, he says, um, I got fogged in, Bobby. And Bobby said, I called. There was no fog. There, you know, there was no reason. And <laughs> Jack Sheldon says, Bobby says, there are many ways to get fogged in. That was Jack's line. And Jack came and sat down next to me. And we did the session. And everything was beautiful. Jack was wonderful. And at the end of the doubles date, so 9 to 12, you know, 1 to 4, at 4 o'clock, I'm putting my horns away. And I'm pretty quick because I have another session to go to. I'm putting my horns away. I turn, Jack's gone. The creeper is gone. So he would creep in and creep out. and uh, But that his personality was so beautiful and he was so funny and just a sweetheart of a man and uh so natural i mean you hear jack you know it's jack sheldon playing you know i i saw one of the interviews you did with sweets and he was talking it was beautiful and sweets was talking about how you had to be an individual how you, how you had to create your own sound um that's the case with me and 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 back in the people that I worked with back in the day, when you heard uh, Conrad Gazzo playing lead, you knew it was Conrad Gazzo. You know, uh, when you heard um, Conte Condoli playing solo, you knew it was Conte Condoli. You heard Pete Condoli, you knew it was Pete Condoli. Uh, you know, it's just um, Plaz Johnson. You knew it was Plaz Johnson. Um, I um, listened to everybody, and I picked up everybody from playing records and records and listen, sitting next to them and playing and picking up their little little innuendos and their little this, a little that, a little that, and I picked it all up and I put it all together and then I became myself. And when you become yourself, then you have a signature. And um, so I listened to Lee Morgan. I listened to uh, Kenny Dorm. I listened to, after Bobby Hackett, this is, but Bobby Hackett was the one that got me playing like lyrical and uh, tunes and stuff like that. And then uh, I listened to Lee Morgan. And like I said, um, and Nat Adderley I listened to as well. Uh, and then, um, oh, there were so many people. And, and of course, Clifford. I listened to Clifford and Miles. And, you know, for what it's worth, when I was playing and I heard Miles, Miles did not touch me like, like Clifford did or Lee Morgan or Kenny Durham, uh, players like that, Charlie Shavers. Uh, there was something about that. Uh, Miles was different, completely different, uh, his own signature. And I, I didn't understand that then. But then the next person was Maynard Ferguson. And talking about a culture shock, because these records my brother had, you know, 
and I wouldn't play along with all these records. And my brother's on the road, and I'm upstairs uh, in, the, in our house in Maple Heights in the suburbs of Cleveland playing along the, with these records. Well, I go from cornet to trumpet, and now I'm trying to play along with Maynard. Well, I'll tell you, he made me work really hard. But I got it, you know, and I got it and I was able to do it and play along with his records, play Maria and play all these different things. And um, so, like I said, I three things I don't like to do is play high, loud and fast. Those are three things I don't like to do. When I want to hear when I want to hear a person's soul and hear them play, have them play me a ballad and then I'll know who they are. Because you can't tell who they are when they're playing like... Uh, well, we did that uh, Cherokee with Arturo Sandoval. And, and I mean, how can you tell what a person is, what their soul's like when you hear that? I mean, it's just notes that are flying by a mile a minute, you know, and then high notes and it doesn't tell you anything. Do you have a sense of, I'm going to refer back to that um, Nature Boy recording. There's was some pretty sophisticated uh, orchestrations behind you. Do you have the kind of ear and chordal knowledge that you know what those chords are when you're improvising over them? Yes, I do. I do. I uh, And I learned that basically, I was born with perfect pitch. So I hear all the inner voices and everything that's going on. I hear them all. So when I first started playing jazz, I was, well, I was probably 12. And my brother was, uh, my brother was also a piano player. And, and very nice. And he uh, he would come over uh, to the house. I mean, he'd be at the house. And his friend Lenny Russo was a drummer, and I, who I worked with, in the, sit in the back seat with his drums on these gigs when I was fourteen. But he'd be there, and they'd play they'd play the blues. I'll never forget it. And they'd start playing the blues, B flat blues. And my brother says to me, "Play." I said, "Play what?" He said, "Just play." So I started playing. And uh, when we go to the four chord, if I hit the wrong note in the four chord or the five chord or whatever it was, uh, then we'd go back to the, the root and start over. You know, we just do chorus after chorus after chorus. And when I'd get to the four chord the second time around, I sure wouldn't play that note because it didn't fit. And also the same thing with the five chord. And it, it was just over and over. And it's a matter of just uh, playing and hearing and knowing what sounded right and what fit and what didn't fit. Uh, then later on in life, you, you learn that um, all the notes fit if you want to put them in a, you know, in a certain place in a certain uh, melodic line or, or a phrase that you're playing. You know, you can go out. You can go as far out as you want. You know, and now I don't know if people would enjoy listening to it, but it's uh, you know, uh, if that makes any sense to you, I mean, you could really take it out. It does. I think Bill Watra said you can you can go out, but you better know how to come back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. You have to come back to to make some sense to them. You don't want to want them to leave. You know, if you're playing a live live concert or live performance. You know, it's like uh, when you know. And growing up, when I played with these um, in Cleveland, I'd play. I played in this one uh, band. It was called. Um, well, the club was called Paderewski's. And uh, it was um, family was related to Ignace Paderewski from Poland and uh, the famous composer. And I think it was the minister of something in, in Poland, in Warsaw. But uh, the family was Polish and they, um, it's called Paderewski's. And it was a rhythm section. And the mother and the father, uh, they did a show too. And they sang and comedy and all that kind of stuff, you know. And um, it was just trumpet and rhythm section. Well, my brother had the gig first. And it was five nights a week. It was a nice, nice supper club. And uh, he had it first. And then in Cleveland, Gary Barone. I don't know if you know Gary Barone and the Barone brothers, Mike Barone and Gary Barone. He was a trumpet player. And he's older. And he's in between my brother's age and my age. And he was, uh, my brother left that gig and Gary did it. And then after Gary, I got the gig. So I was 16 and I'm playing. But what was great about it is we'd play all these tunes. I mean, uh, you name it, you know, Moon Over Miami, um, you know, um, Poor Butterfly. Uh, God, I can go on and on and on. But I learned all these tunes 
I knew a lot of them from playing music minus one, which I did. I did that a lot. It was great. But I but I'm playing these tunes. But when we get to the bridge, a lot of times I wouldn't re remember the bridge, so I would play another bridge. Well, this is Jan Paderewski, the piano player. It was his band. He it was a wonderful piano player, but he only knew the tunes and the keys they were written in, and that's it. He could not improvise whatsoever. So it was just so when I'd go into a bridge for another tune, uh, he was completely lost. He was like, "What? What's he doing? And what's going on?" And then I'd come out of that eight into the into the last eight of the tune into the melody of the of the song we were playing. You know, it was, I wasn't improvised. I just played another bridge because I didn't know it. At the you time, were, you were doing was, Charles, Charles Ives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was. But you know what? It it was it was a great experience. Uh, it really was. Uh, to this <laughs> day, sometimes, I mean, when you think about it, now think about all these tunes. You could play so many bridges are so similar. It goes back to the you know to the to the last date of the tune. So I mean, I mean, well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's did, like uh, did the um. Did the rock and roll on AM radio enter this picture at all? Was that part of the repertoire? For me, uh, my sister is a couple years older than me. So I'm the baby in the family. So when rock and roll came out in the 60s, when it was happening, and she was driving, and I wasn't driving yet. I was 14, but I mean, she was 16. And she'd, we'd be driving in the car. She'd have AM radio on and playing all this rock and roll. And I hated it. Oh, I hated it. I said, I, I said, turn that off. Turn that off. Let's get the FM station so I can hear some jazz in Cleveland. And uh, I just couldn't stand it. I really couldn't. The only only group I really enjoyed listening to at all were the Beach Boys because they had harmonies, you know, like because I loved listening to like, um, to, um, well, well, who's the group, the singing group I love so much? Um, uh, jazz, more of a jazz group. Four freshmen. Yeah, the four freshmen, exactly. Four freshmen, lads. So for AM records and for pop music, uh, the Beach Boys were the closest thing to that as far as, because they had voicings and it was real nice rather than just the rock and roll that was of the day. I did I did enjoy uh, when Motown came out. This was later though. When Motown came out, I did a lot of Motown. And uh, it was great, you know. It was it was funky and it was loose. It was happy, and precision didn't have to be wasn't a part of the picture, you know. Uh, precision, even a buddy's man, you know. He's restricted. I mean, he was very strict as far as precision, but not to a degree of. Uh, in other words, if a a clam. Um, a little bubble, I'd say, is beautiful. You know, I mean, a little signature. I do it. I do it. Sometimes I do it purposely. A little, a little, you know, a little purposely, a little thing like that. And then I may may introduce that again later on. Uh, I'll introduce it to show that it wasn't a mistake. That it was something that I actually chose to do. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's. Oh gosh. What can I say? I, uh, Before I leave your childhood, I just wondered what it was like to be making some money and going to high school or middle school, wherever you were. Did 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 you stand out as a as a as a student? Like, man, he's playing gigs. You know, actually, yes, uh, that's true. I um. When I was in middle school, or junior high, we called it then, they call it <laughs> junior high school. I was doing these, uh, like I said, I was doing these gigs and playing these and then making some money, not a lot of money, but it was some cash, you know. And uh, But I knew, I knew that I wanted to be a trumpet player uh, already. I knew that when, because my brother was, geez, my brother was, when I was 14, my brother was 22. He was, uh, he had already been on the road with the uh, uh, Ray McKinney band, the Glenn Miller band. He went out with uh, Ralph Martiri's band before that. Uh, and I saw him and then he buys a um, Triumph TR3. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, brand new car. I'm like a sports car. And I'm thinking, well, that's what I want to do. I was too young to, to to look at anything else except having fun playing what I wanted to do, music, and to be able to make money to, to, to live. And uh, so I ended up just... I knew, do you remember in high school, I don't know if you had to take an exam that said what you wanted to do in college. 
Well, I remember, I remember it was 10th grade. And I remember filling it out and uh, just immediately, you know, I'm a musician. That's why I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And everybody, all my friends, they were filling out this form. They had no idea what they wanted to do for a living. No idea. And I, I saw them after I went on the road. The, I was on the road for the summer of 65 with the Jimmy Dorsey band before I went to Cleveland Institute of Music. And when I came back that first semester after I saw, I saw them, and every one of them had changed their major. Every single one of them changed. They had no idea what they wanted to do when they were in 10th grade in high school. Not one of them. I did. I knew because I knew it when I was a kid that this was what I wanted to do. And uh, and what a beautiful life I've had. You know, it's been absolutely fantastic. I, I uh, was trying to come up with a description of that. And it almost sounds like someone writes a book. Uh, Chuck Chuck makes good, and it's it's all like fantastic. Yeah, well, you you said you read something like that. No, I was I was thinking of like almost like a children's book, and an aspiration to be a musician, and um, how these wonderful things kept happening to you, but but that you were ready. Well, you know the training I had. You know, like I said before, that uh, the training is very very important. I mean. Um, you know, it's you on Racy used to. Um, I okay, let me get to this. I had a teacher by the name of Harry Herforth at uh, in Cleveland when I was in high school. Now, before him, my first teacher was a vaudeville trumpet player in Cleveland, and I did some, uh, I even did a vaudeville gig, and it was when it was real vaudeville, it was down in Short Vincent in Cleveland, and um, with uh, an actual, you know, it was a burlesque show with the girls, all the girls, you know, and the tassels and and the whole thing and the pit band. And they were like, oh, you know, like uh, they had they had day gigs. And at night they would play in the pit in this for this vaudeville show. And I couldn't believe what I saw there. You know, I mean, the, you went into the basement and, they, and you got into the pit. The pit would raise up and then you'd be up there and you could look at this, watch the show and play to the show. And mainly you had to go, ta-da, you know, uh, when um, at because they had great comedians too. There was one comedian that um, oh he was I can't think of his name at all, but he was he was kind of a famous vaudeville comedian anyhow. And um, one of his uh, they did a, a line a, a bit where he said to um, one of the one of the girls says, "What is your favorite song?" And she said, "The William Tell Overture." And I, I'm not, I can't really, I can't tell this because the kids will see it, but uh, it was, um, you know, rum titty, rum titty, rum, 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 right? Well, you can imagine the girls, you know, okay, if you could see that. And, and I don't know, I think that. you need to describe it a little bit more. <laughs> but you don't mind? I mean, if this goes on? No, okay. I don't mind. Oh, okay. Uh, you can always edit it out. Um, okay, so he says, what's your favorite? She said the William Tell Overture. He said, okay, so... There were seven girls. So he had one of the girls facing her, her butt, facing the audience, you know, the, the audience. Sometimes just all men in there, you know, with hats on their laps. And then uh, then the other girl facing forward. I'm 16. Now another girl facing forward. And then another one facing, the butt facing us. And then three girls in a row with facing forward. So... <laughs> He goes, rump, titty, rump, titty, rump, rump, rump. And I mean, ta -da, you know, so now <laughs> I'm 16. I'm like, and these guys, uh, I mean, they're like sleeping. They're sleeping pretty much in their chairs. It was a trombone, pair of sax, two, yeah, trombone, sax, and um, a drummer and a few things like that in the pit. And they would be sleeping. Until they'd hear the the punchline, you know, rump titty, rump titty, rump rump rump, rap, you know, you know, you know ta da, and so, I mean, and you couldn't get out of the pit. So when they had to relieve themselves, you know, I mean, oh, gosh, I mean, I'm seeing this at 16. I'm like, my goodness gracious, this is unbelievable. But uh, it was, but it was when they had real. Once again, this was real. It wasn't like a, a girly bar you go to this today or something with a dollar bills. I mean, this was a real show and it was wonderful. I mean, I, I got to 
I'm, I was started so young and I'm now 76 and I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm getting older as this year, I'm in December. Anyhow, I'll be, I'll be 60, I'll be 77. But anyhow, it's, um, back then I, I caught the very, I caught the end of like the mutes and all the different plungers. We had a stand where you'd have all the different mutes. You grab this one, you grab you didn't have time, you put one in your in your lap, you know, and you pick that up and put that in, throw it in, go ta-da, ta-da, whap, 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 you know, in the in the hats, you know. I learned all that. That's how I started with all that. And then um then when I went on the road with other when I, that was the Jimmy Dorsey band and things like that. And and big bands in Cleveland that you would do. Because you had uh, those were the charts, they had that wah wahs and and um, you know, just all different kinds of mutes and different sounds, which was wonderful, you know. And the Jimmy Dorsey band, a lot of Cy Oliver charts that were just wonderful, just wonderful. It was a great book, Jimmy's book. Uh, it really was a wonderful book, and more so. I think it was a, it swung a lot more than the Tommy Dorsey band that book. Well, you Jimmy. can't learn that. Uh, I don't think they teach that in jazz education now. Um, maybe there's not a reason for it, but I'm. I'm envious that uh, you had that experience and that down the road, some of the things you did say, well, this is easy compared to uh, being in the pit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but once again, I'm getting back to it was fun. You know, it was fun. You know, it's, it's music should be fun. It should not be uh and that's why I chose not to be a chose not to be a classical player. I didn't want to sit there and count a hundred bars and then come in. Uh, I wanted to play my horn. Uh, and that's why every night I'd go every night in the road I'd go to a club and play with different players. That's how I learned. That was the school. Of, that was my college uh, training and learning how to play from different players all over the country and um, all over the world. For that matter, um, it was it was um, that's that's the way I think it should be. Of course, it's no there, there's no opportunity for that anymore. You have college bands which are wonderful. You have North Texas. You got oh, there's so many. Indiana, I'm sure your school's fantastic. Uh, Florida, there's a lot of places. I had a choice, you know. Except our family was very poor, and and I um I got a full scholarship to the Cleveland Institute of Music. So and I wanted to study with Bernie Adelstein. And Bernard was the, the class, he was the principal trumpet player with Cleveland. And I would do gigs with him in Cleveland, in commercials. We would do jingles, and I'd play first, he'd play third. You know, so we were good friends. So when I went on the road and I came out, I had a full scholarship. He didn't know this. And I came there to the school to study with him. And I said, he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to study with you. He says, no, you're not. You go back on the road. Because he knew that's what I wanted to do. And I, I, it was very hard. And I said, no, I want to study with you. I want to learn from you what I can. And finally, he gave in and said, OK, but only if you come to my house and study with me at my house. Because I was he had all postgraduate students except me. I was the only one, an outsider. And um, these postgraduate students, I'd hear them play. And they were going all over the place. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I can't do that. you know. So he took me in to his house. And uh, I, it was the great, it was great, fantastic, you know. And uh, so I learned from him and then he knew like I wanted to go back in the road and, and then I did. I went back around the road right away and uh, with the Jimmy Dorsey band again. And then I got heard, uh, I was after, I was in Cleveland playing an R&B band and we opened for Woody Herman's band. And on the Woody Herman's band was Bobby Shue. And that's when Bill Chase was playing. And Bill was like the star of the Woody Herman band. But she was in the trumpet section. And I knew Bobby because he was on the road. I met Bobby when I was 12 or something like that. Because he was uh, he was on the road with my brother on the uh, Glenn Miller band. So I knew Bobby through that. And I was the kid, you know, and Bobby. So Bobby is there. And, I'm, and I only wanted to see Bobby. And we opened, we were doing an R&B band. It was a wonderful R&B band. And we were opening for them. We were rehearsing. And um, and it was after they did their sound check. And they took their break. And we are rehearsing. And he told Sal Nestico, he says, uh, I want you to hear this kid. So they didn't leave. They went up and they sat all the way up in the very top of the venue. 
and to listen to me play. And uh, and the shoe, and, you know, Bobby and I, we're like brothers, real real brothers. And and uh, next thing you know, I get a call to fly to New York to audition for Buddy's band because he was on Buddy's band after he left Woody. And um, and I went in to audition. I, they, I must have auditioned a dozen trumpet players. That uh, and Buddy was a stickler as far as like getting somebody to play. It was split lead and jazz chair. It was just hard to find somebody to play the split lead and jazz because that's what Shu and I did. We split that book right up down the middle. You know, he'd play lead on one, I'd play jazz. I'd play lead on one, he'd play jazz, and it was it was beautiful. And um, so I went into audition in New York, Basin Street East, and uh, I sat and I played, and I thought I did a great job. Uh, but you know, I, mean, I was 18, and um, so Buddy, Buddy calls me into his dressing room to sit down in his dressing room, and he's there in a smoking jacket, and he says to me, "Kid, you got the gig." I said, "Oh, fantastic, Buddy! Man, wonderful." He said, "Except when you play your solos, I want you to play like Sweets Edison," and I said, "Well, I can't do that." I said, "If you want to." get Sweet Edison, then you call Sweet Edison. And then he, there was a pause, and he said, kid, you got the gig. He, because I stood up to him, I said, I can't do that. You get get him. So um, that was the old school. And the old school was, give me a, uh, give me a, I'll say it again, give me a prick that can play. There wasn't any nepotism like there is these days. These days, it's just, you know, uh, I mean, it, you'd, you'd be in a section where the guys didn't get along, but they played great. That was that was what the deal was. And they always had great bands, great bands. You know, it's very hard to find bands like that these days. Gordon Goodwin's band has a um, friendly band. They all they all get along great and there's no nepotism there. They're all great players. Uh, but I don't know how many bands are like that these days around around the world. I'm sure there are. I just uh, but they're they're far and, you know, there's not many of them, I would say. Let me, I wish there were. That's fascinating uh, backstory to all that. I want to take you um, back to your busy studio life. I I, I came across one of those um, online Chuck Finley discographies. You know, uh -huh. it's this never-ending scroll, and <laughs> I start I started to count. Literally, I was you know, and I said, "This is not going to work." But what I did see is that. In 1979, according to this list, you were you played on 26 LPs. Like that's more than two a month, and everybody from Dolly Parton to to Tom Scott. So I don't have a question; it's simply an observation. And but I wonder if you can describe. Let's jump ten years later, 1989 a day in the life of Chuck Findlay when you were on the Tonight Show band, what was a typical weekday like for you? Well, that was wonderful, actually. But, um, well, it was, it was, uh, it was not really nice because I mean, John Adino had passed away and I was in Germany doing, I was doing a tour, a little tour with uh, Peter Herbelsheimer in uh, Germany. And um, I was considering actually moving there because our son was young. And I wanted him to uh, get the culture and go and learn other languages other than just English, you know. I wanted him to learn German and go to schools there. They, they know three, four languages, everybody over there. They speak. And I feel like a fool when I went over there the first time, just speaking English and, you know, learning a few words here and there. But but we don't get that training here, you know, over there. Then once again, if, if I went to Oregon, uh, there would be another language. Or if I went to Nevada, it would be a different language. So Europe is different in that aspect. Um, but in 89, um, John Odino passed away and I was in Germany and I was in Hamburg. And I actually, Doc Severson called my wife to tell her first and uh, to ask, find out where I was. And she said I was in Hamburg, Germany. And, uh, and he told her about Johnny passing that, that he would love me to do the gig. Uh, and um, Johnny and I were so close and just wonderful. What a marvelous man and player he was, you know. And then that trumpet section was um, Conte Condoli and Snooky and and uh, Johnny and Maury Harris. Well, Johnny had passed. So Doc and I go way, way back to 1965. 
when I first met Doc, but uh, that was another story. I could, I could tell you that real quick if you want. Sure. Uh, I was on the Jimmy Dorsey band and we were doing, on Long Island playing at a country club. And uh, I was doing some Carmine Caruso exercises and warming up before the gig. We had quite a few hours, maybe two or three hours before the gig started at this uh, golf course, country club. So I went up and I was doing uh, some exercises. I went up to a high F. And out of the woods, uh, Trevor answers me with a high F. Now, these, you know, I'm 17, and these guys in the band are like, you know, ribbing me about, oh, boy, Chuck, they're, they're a diamond dozen here in New York in the Big Apple. So then I went up to a high F sharp. Out of the woods comes a high F sharp. I'm like, geez, now they're getting even more on me. I go up to a high G. High G comes out. An A flat. A flat comes out. I go up to a double A. A double A comes out. Now they're really, really ribbing me, you know. I'm thinking to myself, okay, enough of this nonsense. So I went up and played a double D, and I held it really good, nice and strong. Dead silence out of the woods. Dead silence. And all of a sudden you hear, I said, that's Doc. That's got to be Doc. It has to be Doc Service. It's not some young kid that you're talking about in New York. So I go through the woods. And I think this other trumpet player, Gene Benson, went with me. And we go through the woods. And that was when Doc was rehearsing his little band. So... Uh, we still had quite a few, we had oh, an hour or so, more than that, before the gig started. So I'm sitting there with Doc, and he asked me how I did that. And I told him uh, the, the Carmine Caruso, I studied with Carmine, and everybody was. He was like the guru of um, brass instruments. Um, you familiar with Carmine Caruso at all? You are. Okay. So anyhow, I showed him the exercise, the, the six notes, the harmonic series, and then the seconds to build up your strong. No, that's the muscle building exercise. And I showed that to him and I gave him that lesson uh, in the woods. And that was, I was 17 and he was 37. He's 20 years older than me. So then, I, then I'm on Buddy's band. That was the first meeting. Then I'm Buddy's band in 66. And I joined the band. Uh, the Tonight Show was uh, traveling different places. They were in Chicago, we were in Chicago. And uh, the Tonight Show was there in Chicago, and Johnny and Doc, and Doc, they come to the gig, because Johnny loved Buddy. He played drums and just loved Buddy, just loved him. So they're sitting there, and once again, I meet Doc, and Doc's there, and I'm playing with Shu, and we're just roaring up there with Buddy's man. He loved it. And then uh, then the incident, uh, then, of course, uh, here in L.A., I run into him every now and then. And then um, Humbert getting back to where it started when they get called to do it, the gig. So uh, what happened is that um, my wife called all the, all the other guys in the band uh, to come to my room. Uh, you know, so it wouldn't be a shock that I'd have my friends with me. And so we went down to the bar. I was wondering why they all came to my room. It was after the gig and you know, normal time, you know, time to, you know, go schlafen, you know, take a, go to sleep, you know? So we go down to the bar and order cognac, and we're drinking cognac down there. And I uh, go up to my room, and Celia calls me and tells me that Johnny had passed away, and that Doc wanted me to be uh, take Johnny's place. So then Doc called me the next day, and uh, the rest is history. Then that's when I was on the band. Now, that was a wonderful gig, because there was no contract with NBC. The contracts ended when The Tonight Show moved out to L.A., uh, in New York, um, they had they were signed. You, know, you had contracts with NBC, or you know they had they were like lifetime contracts, and um, that ended. And Snooky had to stay actually for a year, and so did Tommy Newsom, I think. A couple guys had to stay before they moved to L.A. to finish out their their contract and uh, for their buyout. So they stayed for a year, and, and that's when uh, Jimmy Zito was on the band, and uh, they had. Um, I don't know who took, uh, well, they had, they had enough trumpet players anyhow with Johnny before uh, Snooky moved out. And then when Johnny passed, um, Snooky was there. There was no contracts anymore with NBC or any of the big, or MGM or Paramount, none of them. Uh, they were all individual. Um, you just went in and uh, worked for the company, right? Well, uh, the gig was great because I, if I wanted to do records, I could do records. I didn't have, I could send a sub to the Tonight Show. Uh, you know, I could, uh, so I wasn't being stifled as far as doing my records because I was so busy doing records. And, but I would, I would, I would always made it a point to be there because I loved it so much. So I'd do the Tonight Show. And then, uh, I, but that didn't start till one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. 
So I, I could do a morning record date. I could work at I could work at uh, Paramount. I mean, the uh, Universal. I could work at Paramount. I could do a record date, and then uh, then I do the afternoon gig with the Tonight Show, and then all night I record, and I'd work till like two in the morning or something like that. You know. When, when did then, you When did you sleep? Well, that's another thing. I you know from two to, well, probably four in the morning till eight, three in the morning to eight. I'd get four or five hours sleep. You know, and then uh, go to work. But uh, you know, when you're that busy doing things all the time, I'm so used to it. It was not. It was no big deal. I uh, I was having so much fun. You know, uh, can I say? Let me ask you if you became a, a popular call to come in and solo as well as the section work. Did you find that after you did it a, a lot? that you might try to alter your style a bit, depending on the artist or the producer. Oh, yeah. You have to, you have to yeah. make them happy. You have to make them happy. How did you, know? you learn? You just learned from experience that Quincy Jones would like this kind of thing and Barbara Streisand would like something different. Of course, that was, that's from, once again, playing all different styles and listening. You have to listen. You listen to records, listen to the radio. You gotta listen to the what's going on. You know, when I listen to Sweets, like I said, you know, um, if you wanted to, somebody say, "Well, I want you to play like Sweets," or "I want you to play like Miles," um, I had it in my head. It was in there. Uh, all the motors were in there uh, that had all that information in the computer. You know, it was all in in here, and I just had to pull it out and say, "Okay." I know that, I know how to do that, and I'll do my best job sounding like him, but it's gonna be me and my soul and my my being like Sweets or like Conti Condoli or Snooky or Maynard, whenever and they had me do the Maynard or whatever I had to do, I did it. Uh, but I had the knowledge from listening. And uh, you just, once again, that's, that's, that's being a soloist, you know, being like a, you know, if they wanted a Dixieland solo, I'd play a Dixieland solo. Um, mariachi vibrato is different than it Italian vibrato. Uh, they're different. Uh, so they wanted a mariachi vibrato, you use the mariachi vibrato. If they wanted an Italian vibrato, you use the Italian vibrato. Uh, they're all different. But that, that you can only learn by listening. And uh, you have to listen. And I was fortunate enough to be able to sit next and listen to them live. You can't get that kind of schooling. Uh, that schooling is, um, you know, what you're doing is wonderful because you can play, at least these, the students can listen and get something out of it. You know, like I told you before, Bobby Hackett was first. And if they haven't listened to Bobby Hackett, they need to listen to Bobby Hackett. Bix Beiderbeck, listen to Bix Beiderbeck. Listen to Charlie Shavers, you know, listen to these people and and listen to, listen to Pops. You know, I had a, with Sweets, we were doing the Hollywood Palace and with Louis Belson's band. And Louis is married to, you know, <laughs> married to, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, she was, Pearlie May was oh, just, Bailey. yeah, Pearlie May. She was fantastic. Yeah. And um, and she had a show at the Hollywood Palace and the band was Louis' big band. And I was in it and Sweets was in it and Conte Condoli and John Adino was the trumpet section. And um, Pops is on the show one day. It was well, actually it was two dates, one day of rehearsal, one day for recording. And Sweets knew Pops very well. And he came over and was with us all day. And I got to hang out with Pops, with Satchmo, with Louis Armstrong all day. And it was two days I got to hang with him. And one of, I mean, that kind of experience and that was so beautiful just to listen to him talk and to talk to him and him and Sweets, the two of them going back and forth and talking telling stories about this and about that and and uh you know so just me being around all these people i got to meet all the legends and all my idols all my idols i got to meet them all and uh it was that kind of an experience you don't really get uh these days it's i mean those people are all gone anyhow so the only way you can listen to them is listen to records listen to everything they play isn't it amazing that um, those gentlemen, especially the black musicians who went through so much uh, trial 
over the years still had that that life force that that you as you describe like sitting next to them for a couple hours like you just feel better afterwards oh geez it's heaven it's actually it's heavenly i mean you know it really was it's just well, I mean, I never thought that would happen. And Miles Davis, another one I saw him in New York, you know. We didn't get to hang. Um, it was a different situation. That was when we I did the album of Dingo with Miles. You do you know that album? And um and the story, and he was in the movie, you know. And uh, when I did that, I had to I had to be some when you mentioned I had to be somebody, you know. Uh Lala Schiffer, I mean uh, Michelle Legrand, it was, and um I go into the studio to do this, and it's uh, for an Australian production. And um, if you know the movie, uh, I won't get into it, but it, he's in the movie. He's in Australia. and um, But there's a kid in the movie that uh, is a, wants to be a trumpet player and heard Miles play uh, at the airport. And when the BN Miles says to him, well, you know, kid, whenever you, uh, if you ever come to New York and come sit in with me. So uh, anyhow, I was that kid in the movie, the trumpet player. So Michelle Legrand says to me, Chuck, come in here. I want you to hear, you have to be this person. So I want you to listen to this. So he's playing me this cassette tape of all these different sounds in Australia. Well, I'm a golfer and I had been to Australia a few times and I was out playing golf and before this all happened, you know, a few years before, and I heard all these birds and all these different sounds in Australia that you don't hear on this continent. And um, so I had an idea what this kid heard. So that was in my head, and I knew that. So I had to be a jazz player, but somebody from the outback that in his head had all these different sounds. So I used I did a I did a thing where I would um, open up the spit valve uh, uh, on the tuning slide, and you can go and duh, with with that because there's it, there's no center, so you can you swim all over the place with that. I kind of put that in there. Uh, other different different things that I put in uh, as this kid, and uh, I'm on every other track on that album with Miles, and uh, but. Unfortunately, that was Miles was sick. That was when Miles was really getting sick right before he passed. And he didn't come in for those sessions. He came in by himself. Uh, so I didn't really get to hang with him at all. I wish I could have, but I didn't. And uh, But I did get to run into him in New York. I went back to New York in, in the village. And once again, it was a very brief meeting. I sat down next to him in a bar. He came in. I was at the bar with the... We went back with the the uh, orchestra with Jack Elliott and Alan Ferguson. And we did it live at the Studio 8H in New York. So we got there and got to the village when we flew in and everything was closing. But we went into this one place. Uh, we went into the Brucker, Brucker Brothers Club and that was closed. They were all closed already. But this one uh, club in the village who we went into have, to have a taste, myself and Vince DeRose on French Horn and a, a few other players. And he was sitting there. And I was the only one sitting at the bar. I ordered a cognac, I think. And next thing I know, I, next to me is Miles sitting there. And now uh, the interesting thing is I knew that Miles was doing a new album because a dear friend of mine by the name of Doc Lawless, who was uh, also Buddy Rich's uh, manager and road manager uh, when I was on the band, uh, is the uncle of Heinz, Heinz and Dad. So um, he was telling me, he said, Chuck, he was my limo driver, actually. He drove me there. We had a limo pick us up in New York. So he says to me, he says, you know, Chuck, he says, I'm driving Miles around. He's doing a new album. And I said, really? How wonderful. Now Miles is sitting next to me. And I said, I said, I said, Miles, my name is Chuck Friendly. And I said, uh, by the way, I, I love your new album. And he says, how could you? It's not out yet. And I was talking about the, the prior album that he had just released, you know. And that was the end of that. He got up and went downstairs to the bathroom and I never saw him again. So uh, anyhow, just meetings like that, you know. Uh, I you have know, to tell you that, that it does. you know, you, you made me think, uh, I'll tell our viewers that we had like a two o'clock my time appointment for the Zoom and, and you dinged me at 10 of. And I got this flash of Joe Wilder 
Uh huh. You know Joe? Did you know I Joe? didn't know Joe. Well, he just said this thing. He was so meticulous and such a pro, and he talked about how it's a it's better to be an hour early than a minute late, and the whole the whole thing. And anyway, that was just an aside. But you you know, thanks for the memory because I got to know Joe pretty well. Um, I had something I wanted to share with you that I've been I've been fortunate to have sessions with a lot of your colleagues. And we were talking, I, I had a question for one of one of them who, as in your phrase, will remain anonymous. But I asked him about if if the LA scene, if you've done it for a bunch of years, ever got um, tedious or a chore. And he said, this isn't playing, it's craft. LA is an incredible place for craft. You really learn to play your instrument well and in tune to show up on time. The disciplines of the craft are there, but your soul, your spirit, you know, is not usually nurtured. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. I, um, it is a craft, that it is, absolutely. Uh, but it's how you how you take it, I think, I, I, and how you approach that. Um, you know, I'd come in from one session to another, like um, a minute before, and come flying in, get my horn out of the case, sit down and do it, and do my job. Uh, I think maybe that's what this person was uh, explaining, was doing your job. Yeah, you have to do your job. Uh, you have to be prepared for it, but uh, you never know what you're going to get. So um, the being versatile is is the answer to that you have to be versatile like i mentioned earlier about italian vibrato and mariachi vibrato mm -hmm. uh, dixieland solo um, um bebop hard bop solo um they're all different but you have to be able to do all that because you never know what you're going to get and uh but like i said before, earlier as well is that um you know there are players that play notes that's okay that's what you do you know, and you can be a good section player there. And, and, but being a nice person as well, you know, in this section, they're, they're the ones that really need to be nice <laughs> to, uh, to be able to be in that section. I mean, they could play the part fine, but I mean, there are many, many people that could do that. Yeah. You know, but as an artist, as a soloist, that's another thing altogether. I, you, uh, I'm going to share another thing from, here's what Tom Scott had to say about that question. And, and he said that he did some sessions with a producer that did the Partridge family and David Cassidy records. And he said the horn section at that time was me, Chuck Findlay, Ollie Mitchell, Slide Hyde and Lou McCreary. So even if the tune was kind of dumb or mundane, it didn't matter. We were there to play the best damn horn section you've ever heard in your life. We took our part very seriously. We didn't know how far in the mix it was going to be or whether it was going to be there at all. Our job was to go in there and play with one another, which we took great joy in doing. And whatever the music is, man, we'll nail it. So that was soul gratifying just to do that, regardless of the artist. We did that all the time. And uh, actually, Mike Melvoin wrote all those charts for that particular album. And um, but we... Um, Always, one thing I always did, always did after a session, whether it was good or bad, I mean, the, the track. I'm not talking about what we did, but I'm just, uh, like Tom said, we would make it, we would make the record. You know, we're like the icing on the cake. You know, you, or, you, know, you build a house, but you need to decorate it. We decorated it. We would decorate all kinds of things, you know, and make it, make it sellable. Um, this house, you know, because it didn't look very good without uh, any decoration, without it being painted or, you know, furnished or, you know, and, and everything else that makes the house, wow, it's beautiful, you know. Same thing with like a cake and you put the icing on it. That's what we did. And, um, but I would always say thank you and good luck with your project. Always. Because I wanted to thank them for the, for the gig. Uh, and I also wanted to thank them and hope that they did well on their project because there were, there were many, many records that uh, were not really necessarily a great song or great anything, but um, we made magic on those songs, you know, and they did make money off it and they did have a hit. Um, it's uh, If you heard the basic tracks, uh, 
without the horns, without us on it, uh, huh? Can I say? You know, I mean, you could listen to them, and a lot of them, a lot of them are great. A lot of them aren't great. Monk. What, what kind of thing? This could be a, a pro or a con, but would you go home and bother to bring up what your day was like? What kind of sessions? Occasionally. Uh, you know, I've actually, uh, if I did, I told my wife, and uh, she she's my dictionary, my encyclopedia. She tells me what I did and what I didn't do because I did so many things. You know, I mean, uh, there's the ones that really stuck out, of course, you know, like um, doing, let's say, the Dingo album with uh, Michelle Legrand or, um, or uh, I don't know, Al Jarreau things that I did. Or uh, oh, so many things, Bangladesh, you know, with George Harrison. My goodness, you know how fantastic that was, you know, and the tour we did. Um, Peter Herbelsheimer in Germany, you know, things I did there. Uh, many, many things. Uh, the album I did with Bobby Shue, you know, Trumpet Snow In. Uh, what a fantastic album. And to this day, one of my all-time favorites, you know, it's a beautiful album. And Shue and I... Like I mentioned, they're like real brothers. You know, my mom said one time when she saw the album cover, she said, she said, geez, I didn't know I had another son. My mom said when she looked at it, you know, and also knowing how close Bobby and I yeah. are. Bobby, you know? Bobby said that my wife could tell by the look on my face how my day went in the studios when I got home. Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course, Lisa could. You know, uh, Bobby decided... Uh, after, you know, he could have done what I did in the studios, but he decided to teach and go out and play jazz. He wanted to do that. He didn't want to be uh, in the studios like I did. I mean, he would have enjoyed it and, and loved a lot of the stuff, but he wanted, he really wanted to be freer than that. He wanted to be a, a bird, a flying bird and playing jazz, you know. I I didn't have the uh, the hours that he had to do it because I was in the studio. And I'd have to go out on weekends and do like... Uh, concerts and things like that uh, I did play in clubs I did a lot of club playing with Don Menza and the Sextet but um, that was wonderful we played and we did all kinds of stuff so I was always playing in clubs at night so that's on top of all the other things so talking about sleep uh, that took up some of my sleep too <laughs> but uh, I'm still here Monk if you if you had a an, an offer to do like a three week tour with some fantastic band that was put together you do a, you know, a tour of this, of the country. Would that have been hard for you? Like you're taking yourself out of the scene and you're not making the dates people want. Are you talking about back in the day or no? Yeah. Back in the day. Uh, yeah. I really didn't do much of that. I, uh, I would just record for them and then they would get bands and musicians to take on the road. Uh, you know, I, I just did the records. Right. I really didn't. Uh, I didn't. I was so busy. I was enjoying uh, going home for lunch. You know, I lived in Studio City and I'd be in Universal. I'd come home for lunch and Celia would have lunch for me, uh, you know, or dinner, you know. And then um, I was live live close. You know, I always wanted to be close. And I would tell musicians too. the first mood to tell. I said, if you want to be close, you need to be close because you get a last minute call. Uh, somebody can't, can't make it or their car broke down or they got you know, whenever something happened and we need somebody right away, um, you get a phone call and you can, we need you right away, you know, can you get there in like 20 minutes or something like that? And uh, so at that, back in those days, you could, if you lived in um, North Hollywood, Studio City, anywhere like that, everything was in Hollywood pretty much, or Burbank, pretty much all Hollywood, the studios are in Hollywood. And they could be there in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Well, you know? pre cell phone, did, did you have beepers or something? No, we didn't have anything. This was before, this was before uh, pagers or any of that. Uh, it was just go to the payphone or use the studio phone and call them and say, "Can you get here right away?" And they would they would come as fast as they could. Uh, oh no, those were times when we were concerned when somebody was late. We weren't concerned about you know we were concerned about the fact that maybe they were in an accident or they got sick or they you know that was our concern. It wasn't. Uh, that had nothing to do with the business, you know, like somebody running over on a session. And, you know, that happened all the time. Say somebody's 10 minutes late, well, say, okay, we'll start with the 10 because they're in traffic, you know, and there was no no panic. Everything was fine, you know, it was relaxed. 
and and we would always get it done and um with smiles on their faces and our faces too you know as we excuse me as we leave and uh, go do another session wow. so it was all, it was all good monk yeah I, I'm, this has just been a fantastic conversation. I just want to wrap up with maybe two things. I understand that you did some jamming with the Pilar Arcos over the years. With who? With Pilar Arcos. Arcos. Oh, Pilar Arcos. That's my wife's grandmother. Oh yeah, she was a famous, uh, famous Latin uh, from Spain singer, opera singer, pretty much. I mean, you know, she did. Back in the early 20s, I guess it was, she did, um, she was with uh, RCA Victor and uh, what other, my wife, she, what other label? Brunswick. Brunswick. Oh, Brunswick as well. And But they, that was when they did titles, you know, one title. And she would go into the studios and do these different titles, you know, and she recorded geez, thousands of, of titles, you know, back in the day. And uh, she would travel. She was very big in South America and uh, traveled all over. She was born in Cuba and uh, uh, from a family of a circus family, you know. So so I married into a family of circus people, and entertainers, you know. Well, so you I'm, came out of a family of musicians, too. So you've got it surrounded. I am definitely surrounded by all music and art. And like I said before, I thought everybody's house had music and live music in it all the time, you know. And that would be wonderful. That would be one thing. That would be great for kids. You know, when I was growing up, um, we would uh, I would play with this tenor player, and uh, Ernie Krivda from uh, Cleveland, and Val Kent, a drummer. The three of us were real close. And we'd go to Ernie's house in his basement, and we would play out of the real book. And we would play tunes, just me and Ernie, no bass, just drums and tenor and trumpet. And we play tune after tune after tune. And we 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 just that's how we learned to play there, you know, in the basement, learning tunes and stuff. And I think that's very, very important outside of school for these students to get together, form a band, play tunes. You know, you don't need a it's really good with just a trumpet and tenor and drums. You know, yeah, no you bass. Make your own harmony and et cetera. Absolutely. You just play and I'd I'd play I'd play the bass line, I'd walk the bass line. When the tenor would play the solo, and then he would walk the bass line when I'd solo. Uh, very, very good. That's a great experience. And I think uh, they'd learn a lot from that. That's, yeah. um, you know, things that they can do that they can't get in school. Well, the business has changed a lot. So just to wrap up, do you have any advice from the young trumpet player out there who wants to do what you did? Yes, I do, actually. Um if you want, if you want to have something, you can have it. So if you want to be a trumpet player for a living, you can do that. There's room for great players and there always will be. So um, a student trumpet player that wants to become um, a studio musician or play or, or play jazz and have records and make records and things like that, they can do that. It's up to them entirely up to them but there's always room there's always going to be jazz around there's always going to be records being done there's always going to be music period but they need to uh, learn to be a versatile player you can't just do one style you know you need you should be able to play a, a classical uh, piece you know not necessarily um, uh, a principal trumpet player in an orchestra but be able to uh, approach it properly and uh, a lot of that is mental and knowing how to attack the notes and where to breathe properly. Uh, that's what has to do with classical music. There's a pausa, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to do. Now that is necessary. That's the basis. Now you can, that's, now you learned how to walk. Now you need to learn how to, how to uh, jog. And then you learn other stuff. And then listening to records and listening to everybody playing, pick up their, pick their brains by records because you're not going to be able to do it live like I had the opportunity to do. Let them listen and pick the brains on records of everybody's playing. Learn that. Play along with it. Learn it. Transcribe it. It's wonderful. Transcribe the solo. When you transcribe it, then you really know it. And then you can look at it and study it and say, oh, okay. And look at the chord changes and see what you did to the chord change. You know, and and once again, all styles though. Dixieland, uh, like I said, hard, you know, bebop, uh, mainstream, 
uh, you name it. It's all needs needs to be done, but you have to be versatile. And also these days, you need to know how to use uh, you know the Pro Tools and all that kind of stuff because they're going to be asked to do that, and because um, that's the way it is, and it's not going to go away. So uh, if they want to do that, they should have that in their in their they should have that in their file that they can do that because they'll be called to do a solo and you'll do it at home in your in your room and you put the solo and you fly it to them and they they got your solo I do that yeah people ask for solo and I just do a solo and send it to them you know because it's easier than traveling these days and now it's it's a lot cheaper for them not to fly me somewhere but, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You've been very generous with your time. And uh, I'll pause our recording here and say our goodbyes. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Monk. Sure.